Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous Patreons, my British Rail Critics, as well as my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward and Lord Captain Von Thrust III. You are the reason why this content remains cloudy with a chance of meatballs? Yes. I'm going with it. I'm rolling with it. I don't even care. You can't stop me. That's right. And today, we are going to talk about a thing that I was kidding about, okay? In one of my earlier videos about a train versus another thing, I joked that the only thing that might survive an impact with a train is, like, a tank. You know, thinking logically that there's no way someone managed to get a tank in front of a speeding train. And yet, here we are. Now, I know my tone sets the stage for jokes, and I do that a lot, but understand that this was actually kind of horrific, so I'm going to try to continue on and be as respectful as possible. This is the story of the Forced Xena Rail Disaster. In previous videos, I've already set the stage for the Cold War, as well as the status of East Germany, or the GDR. Pretty much under the thumb of the Soviet Union since World War II, the GDR was a rather unpleasant place for most people to be. There were a lot of people trying to escape communism by jumping over the Berlin Wall, or by other means, but the point is that things were, well, Soviet. Very Soviet. But for our purposes, the story actually takes place on the 19th of January, 1988. So this was at the tail end of the GDR's existence. Germany would be reunified two years later in 1990. The process wasn't overnight, but it happened. And Mikhail Gorbachev was the one in charge of the Soviet Union. So by this point in history, tensions between the East and West had softened quite a bit, as Gorbachev took steps to normalize things for regular citizens and make changes that were less about being iron-fisted and forceful, and allowing people to vote and make decisions for themselves. This would ultimately lead to the Soviet Union no longer being a thing anymore, but we're not talking about that today. The point is, I'm setting the stage for you, things were cooling down in terms of tension at this point, but it was still East Germany. It was still not a great place to be, it was still communist, and we are talking about the Berlin Halle Railway, and a section of line that bypassed Force Zena. Forcing is an old Soviet military base, so it makes sense why there'd be tanks there. The tank in question is a Soviet T-64A, an updated version of the T-64s that were introduced in 1963. They're a bit dated by modern standards, but the 64 was revolutionary for its time. These were very good tanks. 38 tons with a 125mm smoothbore gun attached. They're diesel-powered, 700 horsepower, and capable of going up to 37 miles per hour which is pretty fast for such a large behemoth armored column of death. The locomotive in question was a DR Class E11, an electric locomotive constructed between 1961 and 1963. 96 were produced, and they're fine locomotives. There's really nothing notable about them. But they're good, efficient, capable of traveling up to 75 miles per hour, and they're sometimes also called the Class 109. On that night, the E-11 was pulling the D-16, which is an express train that was traveling northbound from Leipzig towards Berlin, and would cross on the tracks that passed by Force Zena. This wasn't unusual. The tracks were frequented very often, and that section was often called Kananenbahn, or Cannon Railway, as since they were within spitting distance of a military base, passengers and crew could sometimes hear gunshots and explosions from training exercises. At 5.43 p.m., the 19th of January, 1988, D-716 raced along the rails at its max speed, 75 miles per hour, or 120 kilometers per hour. It was manned by two drivers, which was actually normal practice for that era. There was nothing unusual that night, like I said. This was totally normal for them. However, at the same time at the military base, a gentleman by the name of Ochapau, who was a 19-year-old soldier from Kazakhstan, was having his first driving lesson on a T-64A. He was being supervised by one Petrichow, who was a 20-year-old soldier from Russia. Due to the way a tank is generally laid out, and definitely the case with the T-64, Ochapau was actually laying down low in the nose of the tank, which is where the driver generally sits. His supervisor was up in the turret, communicating with him via radio. During their exercise, they began heading for a bridge that crossed the train tracks. Ochapau stopped near the bridge, and then he was ordered to select first gear and make a right. Instead, he went for second gear and kept going straight, 
which is not even close to what he was supposed to do. Pedichal realized the error immediately, but he didn't have any driver controls in the turret, so he had to press an emergency shutoff button that the tanks were equipped with. The button actually didn't work, at least not immediately. It was either that, or Ochapal shut the tank down himself after a few seconds. But regardless of how, the tank stopped on the train tracks, and now it won't start again. At this moment, they heard the train approach, and though they tried to move it, the tank refused to start. Having little options at that point, they abandoned the tank and made a run for it. At 5.50 p.m., D-176 slammed into the tank at 68 miles per hour, which killed both drivers on impact. The collision pushed the tank 130 meters, or 427 feet, along the track, as the rear of the locomotive was lifted off the tracks before falling over on its side. The coaches were jostled around quite badly, and a total of six people, including the two train drivers, died in the accident. Thirty-three more passengers suffered severe injuries. Given the remote placement of the military base, first responders were late to the scene, although the soldiers in the barracks did come out to help. However, this would prove to be a double-edged sword, because like I said, this was towards the end of the Soviet Union, very close to the fall of the Berlin Wall. People's anger towards the Soviets was pretty high, especially in East Germany. And when they realized that the train had hit a Soviet vehicle, the survivors turned into an angry mob that began to hurl insults and threaten the Soviet soldiers that were just trying to help. Fortunately, the fire department had shown up by then and was able to calm everyone down. At some point during that night, the two soldiers who were in the tank are finally apprehended, as they allegedly tried to flee from the scene. Oddly, and this is highly unusual, the superiors handed them over to the GDR's civilian police, which doesn't happen. Usually the Soviet military would take care of their own in times like this, but in this case they just gave them to the regular police department. The police quickly figured out that the driver, who was from Kazakhstan, spoke little to no Russian, and his supervisor, who is from Russia, spoke little to no Kazakh. So it's not entirely clear how they were communicating at all during the incident, and it would explain why the driver got confused and did the completely wrong thing. After some time, the police became satisfied with the information they got from them, and decided to return the two men to the custody of the Soviet army, as the common procedure over there was for the army was to return them to Russia so they could stand trial in a military court. Additionally, there was some arguments had over the nature of the tank. See, the tank came to rest in a place that is bad, like the rails, and it had to be moved. The problem was, the T-64 hadn't actually been publicly presented until the 80s, that decade, and some of the technologies on board the T-64 were considered classified by the Soviet military. They didn't want just anybody messing around there, but GDR argued that it's in the way. Are you going to move it? Because if not, we are. Eventually, the Soviets relented and allowed the GDR's armed forces, the NVA, to recover the tank and have it examined off-site. The accident also saw some publicity. There didn't seem to be a strong attempt to bury this one, or perhaps the media simply didn't care. Again, by this point, the Soviet Union was on the downslope, so it seems reasonable to think that a lot of people in media just weren't afraid of them anymore, and the incident was used to show how the Soviets had screwed up. The locomotive and five of the passenger cars were cut up and scrapped on site, and the rest of the train was towed away. To prevent a similar incident from ever occurring again, anti-tank barriers were placed along the track. The railroad also sent the Soviet army a bill for 13.55 million East German marks, which has no record of ever being paid, which is a surprise to absolutely no one. As for the two soldiers that were responsible for the accident, it's still to this day a mystery of what happened to them. Rumors circulate that they were either let go, or they were shot. Journalists, survivors, responders, and even the DR itself actually sent letters inquiring about their fate, and they never got an answer. Which is horrifying the longer I think about it, so I'm just going to stop asking these questions and go with what I know. Either way, the incident was terrible, and I hope this is the only time I ever have to talk about a train hitting a tank. Until next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.